Look, one great argument against Habermas for me is this one. If you were to read all of Habermas, I doubt if you, let's say all about you knew about Germany in the last 50 years, you would have learned it from reading Habermas's books. Would you even have guessed that there are two Germanies? I don't think. Habermas strictly behaves as, he lives, as if he lives in West Germany, it's an immanent critique and so on. And that's what always, already when I was a student, that's what shocked me about Frankfurter Schule. On the one hand, what is their basic project? Dialectic der Aufklärung, which means, to simplify it, the horrible things that happened in the 20th century, Gulag, Holocaust, and so on, are not simply some regression into uh, pre-modern logic, like barbarism returned. No, they were something which was there as an immanent potential of the project of modernity itself. Okay, but then why did they focus in their analysis only almost exclusively on fascism? I mean, it should be done, no doubt here. It intrigued me that isn't Stalinism a much clearer example case of dialectic der Aufklärung. Because fascism was not Aufklärung. It was, as we all know, a conservative modernization, like this impossible dreams, dream, how to have capitalism without capitalism, without class struggle, for this you need an external enemy, the Juden, and so on and so on. But, and uh, incidentally, I've written about it, it's so nice in what way you can account for this basic difference, which doesn't make Stalinism any better, between Stalinism and fascism, even at the level of these apparently totally superficial rituals and so on. To give you one example, do you know, I read this in Anne Applebaum's book on Gulag, that even in the harshest times, mid-30s and then till 50, every year, on Stalin's birthday, all prisoners in a gulag camp were gathered and had to sign, each of them, a telegram to Comrade Stalin, wishing him all the best, and so on and so on. Now, of course, I'm not an idiot. I'm not <laughs> claiming they really meant it. What I'm claiming is this, and here you can see one aspect of the difference. Can you even imagine something like this in Nazi Germany? It would have been totally meaningless in the Nazi universe, I don't know, to gather once a year all Auschwitz inmates and make them <laughs> sign a, a, a telegram uh, all for uh, all wishing all the best to Hitler and so on. Another thing which makes, uh, accounts for this difference, precisely this uh, so-called uh, 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 show trials, monstrous trials, you have something which is specific to Stalinism there, this public confession. You know how it looks, like Bukharin and all of them. You were, let's forget in what way. It wasn't even primarily physical torture. It was more pressure, like, if you don't confess, we, we arrest also your children, whatever. Okay, but the mystery is, why the need for this public confession? And you discover something very strange, how although the one who was at this show trials condemned and so on and confessed, although he was treated as the lowest of the lowest, you know, it's very interesting to read sacred texts of Stalinism, like a short history of the Communist Party, the sacred text, with regard to expressions they use, like it's piece of sheet, vermin, insect, and so on. So, at the same time, you are the lowest of the lowest, but at the same time, it is as if you still participate in universal human mind, that you can account for yourself. For example, I remember reading in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, the Czech trial, uh, Slansky, I think it was, no? Rudolf Slansky, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how 
at the beginning, the prosecutor asked him, how did you become a traitor? And he says, I come from a bourgeois family. Already when I was a young boy, my parents taught me to hate workers and so on and so on. What's so interesting is that you see, you are shit, scum of scum. But at the same time, you participate in universal reason and can tell the truth about yourself. This is unimaginable in Nazism. That's why, not because they were better. You cannot, it would have been the easiest thing in the world for the Nazis to organize a big trial where through torture and so on, they would have made some Jewish leaders, whatever, to confess the plot against uh, Germany. It never happened. It's a, the, my point is that precisely in these perverse details, every prisoner still sending a telegram to Stalin or this confession. This is what makes Stalinism part of Enlightenment movement, that we all participate in it. And again, this is what shocked me. Why don't you find a theory of it in Frankfurter Schule? Now, I did my homework. I know you have Herbert Marcuse, Soviet Marxism, but this is I read it decades ago, but this is just a very specific analysis of Khrushchev, uh, um, uh, his speech on the 20th Congress. It's not more. Then you have a couple of texts here, there, but no systematic approach to it. And I'm not accusing them, Frankfurt and Schule, of being secretly communist. No, they were quite normal anti-communists, believe me. I read in this big biography of Adorno that, for example, in uh, the early 50s, Horkheimer was so anti-communist that he even thought that uh, social democrats shouldn't be allowed to take power. Social democrat in West Germany. So he was much closer to that first generation, uh, Theodor Heuss and so on, liberal politicians. No? So you see, here I think, that's why I'm so practically obsessed by Stalinism. Why? There is a... Na I'm not... Uh, right-wing revisionist, definitely not. I'm not playing the game, which is a very dangerous game going on today, of subtly rehabilitating fascism. You know how? The first, in my country also, Slovenia, it's happening. The first step is to say all sides were doing horrible things, to just apparently uh, equalize them, no? Like, you know, this is an old story, like, okay, uh, okay, Germans did horrible things, but Western allies bombed Dresden and so on, all that, all that. Then you go a step further and you say, very interesting, that uh, you follow this, uh, 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 who is the historian, Nolte, no? Yeah, who wrote a book on Heidegger also. Then you say that nonetheless fascism was a reaction to communism that it took all bad features from communism, like already in Soviet Union before Hitler, they had concentration camps and so on and so on. Then you just have to go one step further and say those who collaborated with the Nazis, they were just confronted with a desperate choice. And they have tragically chosen the lesser of two evils. And in a way, we should understand them, maybe even uh, support them, and so on and so on. And I think this is a very tragic tendency. Not that I have, again, any sympathy for Stalinism, but still I think, not that I think Stalinism was better. You notice for me one argument for Stalinism, that it had dissidents. Dissidents also in the sense of inner party dissidents. Stalin all the time had to fight from Trotsky to others who reproached him for you betrayed the true greatness of communist project and so on and so on. In, in Nazism you don't find this. Okay, we can play the game if Georg Strasser or those early SA Nazis were this. But afterwards, once Hitler established himself, sorry, I'm not aware of any tendency in Nazi Germany reproaching Hitler for betraying the true <laughs> fascist legacy or whatever. And I think precisely this e radical inner tension 
in Stalinism is a, a perverted effect of the fact that there was an authentic core at the beginning. I think that whatever you say, and we can play this game, I'm ready to play it. I'm not saying, I'm not a crazy Trotskyist who claims, oh, if you know this Trotskyist dream. If only Lenin were to survive three, four years more and made the pact with Trotsky, there would be no Stalin, we would have what? A kind of a happy social democracy or what? No, I think the tragedy was authentic. I really don't think there was a possibility of another way to be taken. But nonetheless, it was an authentic tragedy in the sense of it did begin as an incredible emancipatory explosion, it turned into a nightmare. And I don't think we have yet a good theory about it. Either we go too far into blaming, I don't know, entire history of humanity. Like, are we aware? That's why I like it. How crazy is dialectic der Aufklärung, the book? It traces manipulative reason, so-called instrumentelle Vernunft, which begins, which culminates in 20th century horrors. It traces it basically to the very beginning of humanity, the first magic thinking, which is already manipulation. So basically the thesis there is that Stalinism in an ironic sense is the peak, the climax of the entire history of humanity, you know, in the sense of what began with the first magic primitive, so-called manipulations, it culminated in Stalinism. So this, for me, doesn't do the work. I don't, I don't believe in this. At the same time, I don't believe in these simple delimitations. But you know what? I am now getting caught into my own trap of two, three times it did happen to me that I gave a talk, and all of the talk consisted of preliminary improvisations, <laughs> you know. But actually, so let, so let me only, yeah. uh, only tell you that uh, um, like two things. One is that actually it was also Stalin himself who supposed to send letters to himself, as he was also like uh, differently than Hitler was putting his hands together after his own speeches. Yeah, I remember. This is one of my big jokes. And you can check it empirically if you don't believe me that Hitler gives a speech, people applaud, he just stands and recognizes himself as the addressee. When you have a Stalinist leadership, after a Stalin speech, people applaud. Always the leader joins the applause. It may appear nonsense, like, does he applaud himself? No, because the logic is totally different. Stalin's position is not symbolically that of a leader, but that of a perfect servant of the people. That's, that's the basic dogma of Stalinism. We are just instruments of historical necessity or, or whatever, and so on and so on. But, but actually you have the, the theories on the um, explanations mm. tracing uh, the uh, emergence of uh, totalitarianism in Enlightenment, but in the uh, Mm, com like re Marxist revisionist behind the Iron Curtain. Kolkowski's book, the first volume of Main Currents of Marxism, is exactly about this. But actually, you have many other, like Popper is also the same. Like yeah, uh, but okay, for reasons into which uh, we cannot go now. The reason I is probably because they are coming from Enlightenment tradition differently than the Frankfurter Schule. Yes, but what I don't, for example, <laughs> let's take Popper, you know. I, uh, for reasons we don't have time now, I'm afraid it will really be just um, some introductory remarks mm -hmm. <laughs> exchanged between the two of us. You know, for me, uh, 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 I radically disagree with Popper's basic anti-Platonic premise that, you know, Plato... Yes, there are, of course, ominous things in Plato, but my God, if I were to choose between Plato and Aristotle, Plato, absolutely. First, let's not forget this. First, of course, I hope this is a rhetorical question. Did you read Plato's Politeia or what? Republic, whatever you translate it, state. Did you notice two things there, which are extremely important? A, 
There are no slaves there. Plato, Plato's vision excludes slaves. While uh, the good liberal Aristotle, you know, his definition, slaves are uh, talking uh, tools or whatever and so on. Second thing, maybe even more important, I'm sorry to inform you this, but Plato explicitly says, in my ideal state, women are equal to men. All posts are accessible to women also. He explicitly says the fact that women today are not in that position, its uh, historical contingency should be abolished. While Aristotle, on the contrary, he naturalizes, ontologizes even sexual difference, you know, basically uh, male versus female is forum versus uh, uh, morphe versus hile, forum versus matter, and so on and so on. So, no, I think uh, that, uh, you know, when we accuse some past thinkers of proto-totalitarianism, we should be very, very careful. At the same for uh, Robespierre and company, Jacobins, Jacobiner, Jacobiner, Jacobins. My God, I mean, uh, one thing, there is one reason for which I will forever love them. Their relationship to Haiti revolution. You know, Haiti revolution was something for me, one of the greatest events in the history of humanity. Why? Because till then, you know, black slaves rebelled in Haiti around the time of French Revolution. Till that point, uh, all slave rebellions were, let's return home, back to our roots, to whatever, no? And this ruling ideology easily finds it. You remember, if you are old enough, I am unfortunately and some 30, 40 years ago there was a Hollywood hit miniseries, precisely The Roots, of how mm -hmm. an, uh, 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 an American black guy finally succeed in retracing to the beginning and so on. Uh, no, the, Hai the shock of Haiti revolution was that black slaves rebelled there, but not on this program returning to our roots, but we want to do the same as French are doing, French Revolution. And here, not that I'm flattering to you, this is one of the most glorious moments for me of Polish history. Because first, all glory goes here to Jacobins. When Haiti delegation, they won first, visited Paris, Assemblée Nationale, they got a triumphant reception in Assemblée Nationale, immediately recognized as equals and so on. Then Napoleon took over and not only he sent the army to Haiti to crush the rebellion, but he even wrote that this precedent is so dangerous, blacks liberated, that all should be killed, women, children and new slaves brought there. And he sent there the army where a strong contingent was of Polish soldiers. And I must tell you, I hope you know it, it's one of the most beautiful stories that I know. French army was approaching the black army of liberated slaves. And they heard some singing. They thought, oh, some stupid tribal songs probably. When they come closer, they heard what the black slaves were singing. La Marseillaise, of course, and all the glory to Poles. But the most cynical in this yeah. Napoleon's move yeah. was that he sent not just soldiers, but the Polish uprisers um, against partition. So the, the people who actually were fighting for freedom and they... Yeah, the way but that's the beauty. Went. You know what they did then? The Polish regiment. They simply, I simplify the story, realized, my God, we are fighting on the wrong side. And they change sides. This is why, even when there was the darkest temptation around 1804-5 to kill the white people, just black republic, they always exempted the Poles. And I love this as a nonsensical manipulation, but which works so nicely. You know, in Haiti Constitution 1804, they wanted to have a black republic, but they, at the same time, wanted to uh, uh, 
recognize the Poles. So you know what the Article 4, I think, of this Constitution, you know what it says? It says, Haiti is a black republic. All citizens of Haiti, independently of the color of their skin, are black. <laughs> I think it's an absolutely ingenious solution. <laughs> no, but you see what I'm saying, to go back to the point. Yes, horrible things did happen in French Revolution. Although, you know, for me it's all a matter of statistics, in the sense of like, read any precise history, and you will see that there were much more liquidations, killings by state, before Jacobins and after in the Thermidor. That it's very simple. Jacobins didn't just kill ordinary poor people, you know. They dared also to kill some notable people, you know. It's like my friend, the Indian writer Arundhati Roy, you know. She wrote to me, you remember two years, no, yeah, two, three years ago, there were some public rapes in India. And we were all protesting, like five people raped a girl in a bus. I agree to avoid them, it's horrible. But she wrote me, you know why this exploded so widely as news? Because the girl was, in both cases, there were two, three cases, middle class and the ra rapists were poor. She wrote to me, if you want to see horror, go to Bombay, or as you say now politically correct, uh, go to Mumbai and visit brothels there. You discover absolute nightmares. Uh, 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 these middlemen are buying from Nepal and poor parts of India, girls from the age four and five, and simply then you can have her buy her relatively cheaply as a sex slave permanently or I mean it's nightmare and it's not a secret. Everybody knows where this happens. You see, nobody writes about this. And we are talking about thousands of cases like this. Here I have I am returning to my old fashioned paranoiac attitude of our freedom is bourgeois freedom and so on. Yes, we are free, but to what extent? What do we learn in our media? For example, back to India. You read so little bit about this in our media. You know that now in India, there is a big Maoist rebellion, so-called Naxalit, going on. Probably around 800,000, maybe 1 million rebels fighting for their survival in the jungle, those poor tribal areas, army is now decimating them to develop mining there and so on. But uh, it's not, like, it's incredibly worse than all the top hits of our news, West Bank, uh, Palestina and so on. No, India is supposed to be the biggest democracy good, so you, you don't mention this. Did you see the movie, which is a shitty movie, I admit? But it has a moment of truth. Did you see Slumdog Millionaire? You remember what happens there at the very beginning? The guy who is just accused of cheating a little bit at some TV quiz is taken to a police station and they're tortured with electricity and so on. And I asked my Indian friends, is this happening? Yes, they told me. If you are not very rich, police is simply torturing people there. And I was told, this is a wonderful detail, that some uh, Indian democratic intellectuals even organized a protest, a petition, wonderfully ironic petition, where they claimed they demanded from the police to at least raise at the level of Chinese police in Tibet. Because they are torturing there in Tibet, but not if you cheat at the TV quiz, you know. There you are tortured, of course, we know when, if there is a suspicion of uh, contact with Dalai Lama political, no? So their demand was, please, just follow the Chinese there. Torture us only if there is a political su 